Hi, everybody. Annie Reek here with African Violets 101. It's not just for beginners. As part of the ABSA virtual convention in May 2020. I'm so glad you're here and listening, and I hope you've been having a lot of fun with convention virtually this year. Let's jump right on in because I've, I've got a lot to cover in a very short period of time. Here's our plan. I'm going to give you an introduction, a short history of the African violet. We'll cut to the chase, and then I'll leave you with some resources. So that's me. I look very happy in this selfie because I took that on my last day of work when I retired early in March of this year, 2020. Um, probably the most important things you should know about me are that I'm a life member of both the AVSA and the Canadian Society. I'm an AVSA senior judge, and I'm the host about, of All About African Violets, a video podcast which I hope many of you have already seen. And if you haven't, I hope you'll check it out at allaboutafricanviolets.com. So how did I get started? Well, that houseplant book that you see there is very old. It's from the uh, mid-1970s, and it was put together by a man named Elvin McDonald. Those of you who grow the other Gesneriads are probably very familiar with his name. But he was an, is an expert in houseplants, and I've always been an indoor gardener. I have a very green thumb. And my, I, but I had never grown any African violets. Nobody in my family grew them. And my first attempt was in 1975. Someone gave me a leaf of a violet and told me that the way to propagate it was that I should slice uh, on the leaf itself, make slices on the leaf, lay the leaf flat on top of the dirt, water it really well, and that the little plantlets would come popping right up through the slits that were made. Well, I'm sure you all know that that was a disaster and it rotted in very short order because that's not how you propagate a leaf from the African violet. So I tried again in 1979. I was gifted a plant that was beautiful and in bloom and I had it on my desk at work and I had a fluorescent light above me, but I wasn't near a window and it never bloomed again. And I was moving overseas. I gave the plant to a friend of mine and I asked her years later, I said, you know, do you remember that violet? Did you ever get it to bloom again? And she said, oh yeah, sure. And I'm like, this cannot be rocket science. But it was almost 20 years later before I tried again. I was at the Jewel, which is a grocery store here in the Chicagoland area where I live, and they always have African violets in their floral section. So I saw three of them, and I grabbed them, again thinking, this cannot be rocket science. I have got to be able to grow these plants. Well, it was 1997, as I mentioned, and the Internet was just, uh, just getting rolling, and there was something called America Online, AOL. And in, in AOL, there was a group, uh, a board, and a, a chat room for African violets. And the moderators were Daryl Hoover, who many of you will recognize that name. He is a pretty well-known hybridizer, and a woman named Diane Miller. And they're both friends of mine, and they were my original teachers and mentors. And I really learned how to grow African violets online. I was very, very lucky to have access to people from all around the world uh, and all around the country here in the U.S. teaching me how to grow plants. So it was great. And I've, I've been growing competitively since 2001, um, first in Southern California, where I was living, um, and then at home in Chicagoland. So here are some pictures of some of my plants that I have gone to show. And you'll see on the top there is a species plant, species Rupicolis, which is one of my favorites. And next is uh, Mid-America, which is the first violet that I ever saw that made me want to buy a named variety. I'd only ever had big box violets until I saw this plant. And I'm not growing it now, but I have grown it, obviously, in the past, and it's always been a favorite. Some of my ribbons, 
uh, that I get to brag on every once in a while. On the bottom left, you'll see Champagne Pink, which is a trailer that I'm pretty fond of. In the center is Fisherman's Paradise, which grew really, really well for me in Southern California, as you can see. It has never grown as well for me in the Midwest, but it grew really well uh, back when I was growing in Southern California. And then the last one there is Gale, which is a really great vintage plant. And actually, I kind of wish I still had it. <laughs> I don't have one at the moment, but if you ever see that one, it's a great one to grow. So let's talk a little bit about the history of the African violet. Stuff was happening from 1844 to 1892. People were finding things, British people, German people. The person we hear the most about is Captain Baron Walter von St. Paul, who was a German guy who uh, ended up bringing seeds back to Germany. And all kinds of stuff was happening in Europe during this time with these seeds and people growing, uh, you know, growing these plants and checking them out and learning about them. They didn't hit the United States until 1926, which was when a greenhouse in Los Angeles called Armancost and Royston, it's in West Los Angeles, it was in West Los Angeles, I should say, they imported seeds from both Germany and England. And from that, the original 10 uh, were established. So you've all, heard, I'm sure most of you have heard of the original 10 plants, and these were the plants that, that began all of our hybrids. So by the 1930s, an, a pretty famous name in the world of African violets, Frank Tenari, uh, he brought his future wife, Anne, violets instead of candy. And Anne says in a book that she wrote, she tells the story that she managed to kill all of them by following the then standard advice for growing African violets, which was a lot of shade and a lot of water. Well, I'm sure you can imagine that did not work very well. And Anne goes on to describe how she discovered the secret of more light, less water. She was traveling and someone else was supposed to be sure to pull the shades down and be sure to water the violets and neither of those things occurred. And of course, they began to flourish. She came home and was like, wow, this must be the, this must be the key. So they began, the Tenaries began to then grow violets along with their other plants in their greenhouse. Well, by the 1940s, the first pink blossom had appeared. The first girl leaf had appeared. The first white blossoms, the first spooned foliage. And the Tenaries gave up all other plants in their greenhouse, and they focused only on growing African violets. And in 1946, the AVSA was formed. Well, by the 1950s, all kinds of stuff was happening. Uh, another very well-known grower still around today, the Linden Lion Greenhouses, they started uh, in the 50s, and all of these things were happening. The first Geneva Edge, the first white Geneva Edge, the first, um, the first mini, the first star-shaped blossom, uh, fringed blossoms, ruffled foliage, double pinks, first trailers, the first variegated violet, which was Tommy Lou, which many people still grow to this day, was hybridized, and the first green-edged blossoms, and the first pink Geneva-edged blossoms. So the 1950s, all this stuff was going on, well, and continued to go on. Through the, through the coming decades. And by the 1980s, the first chimera blossoms were introduced. So now that's kind of interesting because you kind of think they've always been around, but they haven't. So the 1980s, uh, chimera blossoms were, were happening and African violets began to be very popular in Russia and in Ukraine. And many of the Russian and Ukraine varieties began to be available in the United States starting around the 1980s. So I'm sure you know that there are plenty of them now. We have a class for them in, in the usual show. Well, enough with the history, right? How do we grow them? Well, you guys, I'm here to tell you 
that African violets grow themselves. And I can hear you saying, oh, come on, Annie. But you know what? It's true. When African violets have the right growing conditions, they really do grow themselves. Now, before we continue, I want to tell you that all the information I'm going to share with you today about growing violets works well for me in my growing conditions. It's also very general, very standard information, and it should also work well for you. However, if you are already growing violets and they're already growing really well for you, you know, you don't need to change anything because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So we're going to talk about two musts and three tips. The two musts are light and water, and the three tips are potting mix, the right size pot, and fertilizer. So first off is water. You must have water. And think back to that story that I told you that, that Antonari wrote. The most common cause of African violet death is overwatering. So remember that because less is more where the water is concerned. Less is more where a lot of things are concerned with violets. But tap water is usually fine. Sometimes you might need to amend it a little bit. And the water should be lukewarm or room temperature. And violets prefer water with a pH of around 6.5. So in that photo, I'm not advertising these products. These just happen to be the ones that I use uh, at home uh, to get my water to be 6.5. I use a balanced food uh, from Optimara, the one you see there. I use a pH Down, which is an aquarium product. And in the center, you see that strip with the white circles in the middle, and there are colors on either side. That's my pH test strip, and the little bottle is what I use. That's the, the stuff that you, you put into the water to, in your testing to test the water and see what your pH is. So I use tap water. I run it through a Brita filter pitcher, and then even with, you know, um, that drops the pH a little bit because... At my house, if you look at the bottom of that strip over on the left, it, there's a navy blue side, and it says 9.0. That's the pH of my water at home when it comes out of the tap. And I add fertilizer. Well, I run it through the Brita, and I add fertilizer, but it's still too high. So I have to use pH down in my water, and you want it to be the, right across from that navy blue you see that bright green? Well, that's 6.5. So that's what we're shooting for. And then I use pH down to get my water down to that 6.5. You can water from the top or the bottom, and it doesn't matter. If you get any water on the leaves, just blot them with a paper towel, and they'll be fine. The next must is light. Now, the most common reason I wish I'd known this back in 1979. The most common reason that an African violet does not bloom again is that it's not getting enough light. Now, there are pretty much three types of light that growers use, and I am not going to go into the details of light because, as you can imagine, it is an entire topic all on its own. And in fact, Dr. Min Bui is presenting a, a, a presentation on light here as part of the virtual convention. And let me tell you, he knows way more about it than I do. So I really encourage you to check out his presentation as well. But overall, generally, we've got natural light, and I find a north or northeastern exposure works best for that. Fluorescent light, you can see that photo is uh, two of my stands in my sunroom, and that's what I use. I use fluorescent light for my plants. There are three different types of fluorescent tubes now, T12s, which are the old-fashioned big ones, which are what I still use, uh, T8s and T5s, and they all have different attributes and things that you might want to check out. I'm kind of old school in using my old T12s, and in fact, I use grow lights, the grow light tubes that are the same type, again, that you would uh, use in an aquarium. I like the way they make my plants look. 
So, uh, and you can still get the grow lights. They're considered a specialty light, but they're very spendy. So other less expensive options do exist. And LED lights are uh, one of the newer types of lighting. And you might want to uh, check those out too. A lot of people have tried them. I've tried them. I found for me in the Midwest, they, uh, they don't give out much heat. And my plants uh, were not as happy with them because I live in a much colder climate. I think uh, they work very well in warmer climates. So that might be something that you want to check out as well. So now we get to our tips. The first one is potting mix. Show growers most often use specialty mixes that come without fertilizer. This is usually available online or at a hydroponic or a cannabis supply store. Some people use commercial mix with fertilizer in it. You certainly can do that. You buy that at a big box store. Either mix works best if you cut it with perlite about 60-40. 60, 60 mix, 40 perlite. And if you can find perlite without fertilizer, so much the better. Next tip is pot size because African violets don't want to be in a great big pot. They are most standards, if you grow standards, they will almost never need a pot larger than a four inch pot. Large standards obviously could go bigger and minis and semis will be smaller, about two and a half inches to two and three quarter inches. And when we grow for show, we use plastic pots. Many casual growers grow African violets in self-watering pots and they soak the interior, the, uh, the best tip I can give you is to soak the interior unglazed part of that pot, uh, soak it in lukewarm water for at least 15 minutes before you pot anything in it. That's going to help get that capillary action going if you want to try uh, some self-watering pots at home. Just know that you won't be able to show a violet growing in one of those ceramic uh, self-watering pots. It'll have to be in a plastic pot. Third is fertilizer. Less is more. I've mentioned this already, right? If you're using a commercial mix with fertilizer already in it, you're set. You don't have to add anything to your water because the fertilizer in the mix lasts for about six months and that's about how long you want to you want to be repotting your standards every six months at, and that should work really well if that's your uh, that that's your potting mix choice. But if you're using a specialty mix without fertilizer, you're going to need to fertilize it. So that's what most of us do is we use a specialty mix. So choose a balanced water-soluble fertilizer that's made for African violets, but use it at one quarter strength. Balanced means that all three numbers are relatively close. The one I use is 14... Uh, 14, 12, 14, I think, or 12, 14, 12. I'm not sure which one it is. Uh, or 7, 7, 7. You'll see different formulations, but the numbers will all be very close together. That means it's balanced. And remember, I'm, I, I'm just going to say this again and again. Less is more. Well, it's time for me to wrap it up. Um, I'm sure you're tired of listening to me by now, but I want to just, uh, I'm going to give you a, one little last thing to remember. Actually, I'm going to give you a couple last things to remember. The first one is limit your collection, particularly if you are a new grower, because it's so easy to get carried away with so many plants. And then before you know it, it's overwhelming. So start small, okay? Start small. And the next is, Remember that African violets like what we like. So I think that's why they've been such a popular houseplant for so many decades is they grow well in our homes because they like the same conditions that humans like. They don't want to be too hot. They don't want to be too cold. They don't want to be in a draft. They like bright but indirect light. They like to eat regularly, and they like to drink regularly, and they don't like to have their feet wet for any great length of time. Well, I'm going to leave you with some resources. The AVSA itself, always a great, great resource. The website has all kinds of stuff on it, and there are books, all of which are available through the AVSA. 
And the three books that I think every grower should have on their shelves are the, um, the handbook, which is often called the judge's handbook, but it's the handbook for growers, exhibitors, and judges. Judges is at the end there. It's for everyone who grows and exhibits their plants. It's not just for judges, and it's an excellent reference. Everyone should have it. Pauline Bartholomew's Growing to Show, which was a book that served me very well when I was learning to grow. And Joyce and Kent Stork's book, You Can Grow African Violets, which is a compilation of their beginner columns. They wrote the beginner column in the magazine forever. Forever they wrote it. So they used so that as the basis of their book, and it's a great reference as well. And also, again, I hope that you will check in uh, and check out All About African Violets. You can find the website and check out the podcast at allaboutafricanviolets.com. I want to thank you for joining me today. You can reach me with questions about African Violets at my website. Go to the Show and Tell tab and choose Ask Annie and send me your questions there. Thanks, you guys.